gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house to worship you and to sing your praise. Please bless our leadership this morning that it would please you. Bless all that we do and say that it would glorify you. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Good morning. morning. I want to welcome you to worship on this second Sunday in Advent. Um, So you'll notice I have a young man up here that's dressed a little differently than he normally is. Um, Both of my boys are uh, members of our our Hickory Squadron in the Civil Air Patrol. And the uh, the Civil Air Patrol members were asked across the nation this, this week to wear their uniforms in honor of the anniversary of the founding of Civil Air Patrol. Interestingly, the Civil Air Patrol is actually older than the Air Force. It was founded first. <laughs> so um, so John, is, John is proud of his uniform, and he's wearing that. So thank you, John. You look good, kid. You clean up all right. Now, you may also know that both Ross and John are Boy Scouts. John's wearing two hats today. You want to talk about what you're, what you're trying to do today? You don't want to talk about it. What a shocker. So our boys' troop is doing their their big annual fundraiser. They cooked 500 pounds of barbecue on Friday night. Um, We have seven pounds sold by the pound with us. So if anybody's interested, how much is it per pound, John? It's $10 a pound? Okay. So if you're interested... Please see the young man in the uniform after, after church. He won't be here. But we have seven pounds with us. If we run out, we can get more. They have lots of extra. So um, if you are interested, and it's, it's good barbecue. It's decent. Very good taste. So anyway, enough of that. Um, all right, so a couple of things. Well, let's do this before I forget because my memory has been failing me lately. If you have a wedding anniversary in the month of December, please raise your hand. Jan and Jean, is that it? It's here this morning? I know there's more. There's a list in the newsletter. Okay, well, for all of you, and if there's anyone online watching, if it is your anniversary this month, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, Jan. All right. Oh, interestingly, you know what today is in your life, John? Today is the anniversary of John's baptism, so anyway. Um, so if you have a birthday, Ruby and Daisy, in December, please raise your hand. Jenner, let's see, Miss Joan, Diane, Sue, oh, and our vicar, her birthday was the other day, and which, which one of the Hefner boys is that? I can't see. All right, excellent, excellent. Ruby and Daisy, Naaman, is it your birthday this month too? Excellent, excellent. Ruby and Daisy Daisy is today. Mm -hmm. Pastor Nelson, Bob, excellent, excellent. Who's leading us? Wayne, are you you leading us? I am. Excellent. We're going to wish happy birthday to our brothers and sisters. Happy birthday to everyone. Hmm? Happy birthday to everyone. Oh, everyone. Happy birthday to Wendy. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, my, my little brother turns 50 next week. Woo. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to have fun with that. All right. Um, so Tuesday, Tuesday, um, dinner at Captain's Galley for Everyone, hosted by the women, but everyone's invited. Um, 6.30 p.m. That's Captain's Galley on Sandy, Sandy, Ridge. Road? Sandy. Sandy Ridge. Sandy Ridge Road. I'll get that one of these days. I should remember that. It's not a number. It should have been an easy one. Okay. Um, All right. Children. Children. That's even teenagers, I think. Um, Next Sunday, if you will come for the Sunday school hour, we're going to assign roles for the children's play. The children's play will be next Sunday. 
and you get to have a whole bunch of people much younger and better looking than me sharing the gospel with you so you don't have to suffer through a boring sermon from the, from the guy it's in white and be blue. It's going to and you will be asked to participate. Yes, you will have a role too, so, but no. you no, don't have to prepare for it. participating, trust me. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, ma'am. So, but children, you are leading the charge, so come to Sunday school so you know what your part is, okay? Where are you meeting, Jan? Just down in the Sunday school classroom. Down in the Sunday school classroom. That's over in the parish hall. Parish hall. So, okay. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, we are going to have an Advent service today at five. Are we? I think we're eating, right? Yes, we are. We are eating. What are we having? Soup and sandwiches. Yeah. Soup and sandwiches. Soup and sandwiches. Five p.m. Service. Parish hall. Service at six. Hmm? Service after. And then we'll eat first, and then after after our bellies are full, then we'll then we'll have our, our worship service. Pastor Henry Pollock will be uh, uh, preaching tonight. So, all right. We also have this week Friday will be our Friday dinner fellowship, and this month it's at Granny's on 127. Um, please contact Alice by Thursday afternoon uh, so that she can make arrangements and know how many seats we need. So. All right, a um, couple of prayer requests. Um, uh, I guess a prayer of thanks. Uh, my, uh, my older son had his first fender bender yesterday. And uh, thanks be to God, no one was hurt, damage was minor. The only real injury was emotional. So, and I know I shared that with some of you. Thanks to everyone who, who did pray for him. Um, but uh, I guess just a prayer of thanksgiving that that went as well as it could have possibly gone. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, another prayer request that's not quite so pleasant. Um, one of the members of our church came to me very concerned that there's a, there's a rise in suicides among college-age students, college students in our country. Um, there's been four at state. Um, there's been a, just a rash of these across our country in through and after the, the pandemic. Um, it's a reflection of the loss of hope and despair that our young people have. It's a, uh, I think it's also a reflection of the... <sighs> our society doesn't have an appreciation for the value of life. Our society has become a culture that is more focused on death than life. And life then becomes disposable to people who have nothing but despair. So I would ask you um, over the weeks and months ahead that we all lift this up in prayer. Um, our young folks, our, our children, um, people who've been greatly affected by the pandemic, loss of jobs, loss of church, loss of faith. Um, so please, please add that to your personal prayers and we'll, we'll begin including those in our in our weekly prayers as we lift those up. All right. Um, I know I had another announcement. Do you have an announcement, Mandy? Go ahead. I want to thank everybody who uh, turned all their papers in for the poinsettias, and Gary and Beth are going to get them on uh, Friday. I was just going to let anyone know who didn't get one if they wanted to bring one that will be put them in the church next week so that if you want to bring one, if you didn't get to order one, uh, then please go right ahead. I was going to talk about the Advent service, which the pastor already covered, so um, just thankful to everyone, and also still looking for any volunteers for next year or any time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mandy. All right. Wayne, any announcements for you? No. All right. Committee chairs, anything for your committees? That's what it was. Jennifer, thank you. Okay, so Human Concerns Committee is... Um, as most of you, I think, remember, uh, we do Christmas bags for our shut-ins. Um, so next Sunday, we'll have bags out there. If you would, and the bags will have the names on them. You, you can see the names in the bulletins. Um, there, um, if you have a card you want to write to our shut-ins, if you have you know, little goodies you want to put in there, something small, but we, we want to put together a bag for each of our shut-ins so that they know that we're thinking about them in this Christmas season. There we go, that's what it was. All right, any other announcements? Excellent.
please take a quiet moment and prepare your hearts and minds for worship. I invite you to stand as you are able. We begin with the brief order for confession and forgiveness on page 77. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment of reflection to ponder your specific sins as we lay them at the foot of the cross. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our entrance hymn is number 31, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. The first reading on this second Sunday of Advent comes from Isaiah, the 11th chapter. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bears shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the winged child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Here ends the reading.
The second reading is from the 15th chapter of Romans. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may be one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the, ser confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Here ends the reading. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Pray. Please be seated. Pull out your blue with one voice as we sing together verse 2. Excuse me, verse 2 of number 630, light one candle.
Who's coming to see me this morning? Ellie, you bringing the birthday girls up? Good. Michael, good morning. How are you, buddy? Oh, man, you're getting strong. Hey, Jocelyn. What you got going on right here? What is that? Did you lose one? Did you lose one? Who'd you bring with you? Adley. Adley. It's good to see you this morning. And who's this? Your brother? What's your brother's name? Say that again. Brewer. Jenner, how are you, buddy? Good morning, girls. Happy birthday. Where's where's your sister? You're not coming? You're gonna let your sister do this by herself? Man. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? So, what's that thing that, that you saw John lighten? Can well, yes, they're candles, but what about those candles? Light the big one on Christmas Eve, right? What color is the big one? White. And what is what does the white one represent? baby Jesus, right. Okay, so what do the other ones represent? Do you know? Anybody know? What, what's? No, not Jesus' family. John, do you know? Huh? Well, yeah, they, well, they are the four weeks leading up to, leading up to the, the day of Christmas, right? And since we did noisy offering last week, we didn't get to talk about this, but last week was called the prophet's candle. What's a prophet? Anybody know what a prophet is? No, not that kind of prophet. That, that's, that's spelled with an F. This is a P-H, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. A prophet, did you hear me say the name Isaiah just now? And you weren't listening. Okay, yeah? Hmm? I just said it, yeah. No, but I mean when I was, pre- when I was reading the lesson, the prophet Isaiah, right? The prophet Isaiah talks about what is going to happen to God's people in the future. Right? Have you heard the word prophecy? Prophecy? So in the Old Testament, there are lots of prophecies about what's going to happen to the people. Some of it's bad news because the people misbehaved. What happens when we misbehave? We get in trouble. We get in trouble. We get punished. Right? That happens with God's people too. What does God call misbehavior? Well, when you misbehave, he calls it, it's a, it's a very short word, starts with an S. Stupidity, Stupidity kind of, sometimes. <laughs> now, it's only three letters, though. Sin, sin, right? You know, have you heard that word before, Jocelyn? Sin? You've not heard the word sin before. Okay, all right. So sin is when we disobey God. And when, when God's people did that in ancient times... God would send a prophet to say, you are not listening to me. If you do not behave, you will get punished. I bet none of us have ever heard that sentence before, have we? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's somebody in the front row over there who's got her arms crossed, isn't there? Yeah. So, God sent prophets, prophets like Isaiah. And Isaiah said, but even though you're going to feel God's consequences for your sin, eventually he's going to send someone to save you from that. Okay? Who did he send? Who did God send to save us? Right. Did you all hear what she said? What did, what did she say? What did she say? Jesus. Right? Jesus came as a baby, but he grew into a man, and he saved us. How did he save us from our sins? He died on the cross, right. And what happened on the third day? He rose again. He rose again, right? He conquered death. That is what the Christmas season reminds us of, and the Advent season is us building up to that. It's those prophets who tell us about the, the Savior who's coming, okay? Now, I want to teach you something really, really kind of, inter- I think is interesting. 
So where, did you hear where the prophet said he was going to come from? He said, from the stump of Jesse. Did you hear me say that? From the stump of Jesse. What's a stump? A stump is a wood. It's wood, yeah, it's the base of a tree. Well, Jesse was King David's father, and God promised there would always be a king on the throne that came from David. One of his, his son or his grandson or his great-grandson, right? There would always be one of those. So, here's the thing. Do you know where the prophet said what town the Savior would come from? Any idea? Do you know what town the prophet said he would come from? Here's, here's the tricky part. Everybody say, Natsar. Natsar. That is a Hebrew word. You know what it means? It means root or branch. I'm sorry, it means branch. So if the tree is Jesse and he's the great grandfather, David is the, is the father, okay, then the branches are the children, okay? One of those branches has to be the king of Israel. Well, who is the eternal king of Israel forever? Jesus, right? He is our king. He comes from David's line. Now, do you know how to say town in Hebrew? You probably don't. Eth. Eth. So if I told you branch town, what's the word for branch? What was the first word I taught you? Natsar. Eth. What, what, what word does that make? Nazareth. We've kind of we've Americanized it, but it's Nazareth, branch town. From the root of Jesse will come a branch. And who do we call? What do we call Jesus? We call him Jesus of Nazareth, right? Everything in the Bible points to Jesus is the Savior that God promised thousands of years before he was born. Everything. Jesus is the Savior that God promised. He came 2,000 years ago, and we will celebrate that on Christmas, and he is coming again, and we get to look forward to that. All right. Can you make prayer hands and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you would send us your Son. Thank you for giving us a Savior to help us when we could not save ourselves. Please help us to look forward to his return. Help us to remember what he taught us and help us to lead each day in our lives to walk a little closer with you. All this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. Miss Jan has goodie bags if you want a goodie bag. Oh, you don't have enough for the big kids, so sorry. Thank you for coming to see me. All right. Hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so, second week of the season of Advent. And in keeping with our tradition, we've now lit the second candle in our Advent wreath. And I want to make sure you understand, this is our tradition, okay? There is nothing in Scripture that either tells us we have to do this or that we shouldn't. It's just a nice tradition. It's only about 300 years old, this tradition in the Western church. Okay? And there are different ways to practice it. There are different themes and names for each of the four candles. We have picked one particular way that goes with our tradition in the NALC. So the first candle that we lit last week was the prophet's candle. That candle represents hope for the coming Christ, right? What was our sermon theme last week? Hopeful expectation, right? 
That's really the theme for the whole Advent season, so it's appropriate that that be the theme for the first week. Now this week, we lit the Bethlehem candle. That's the second candle. And this candle represents love for those in need and who have no room, right? No room in the inn, that's what that alludes to. The Bethlehem candle is of course named for the city of David where we have that manger scene that we all think of this time of year, the site of his holy birth. That town, that city is recalled in prophecy. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, God says, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. That's Micah chapter 5. That was our Old Testament lesson this week, last year. And we have, if you've been paying attention, we have a three-year lectionary schedule, right? Year A, year B, year C. And we get different lessons each Advent. So this year, instead of Micah, our focus is on those who point us to the coming Messiah. Did you notice that both the first and the second lesson have the prophet Isaiah talking about the root of Jesse, David's father? He was the beginning of the line. It is God's promise to David that the king of Israel would always be someone from David's lineage, someone on that family tree. And we know that that came true in the birth of Jesus to Mary and her husband Joseph. Joseph was descended from King David. And one of the characteristics of the three-year lectionary we use is that each year focuses on a different gospel between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This year, we use Matthew. Now for Matthew, in everything he writes about the Messiah, everything he writes about Jesus of Nazareth, his emphasis is to present Jesus as Israel's Messiah foretold by the prophets. That is his purpose in writing. He tells Jesus' story showing how that carpenter's son from Nazareth fulfills the Old Testament prophecy. He makes God's promise of a Savior come true in his birth in Bethlehem. Jesus is the Messiah. And Matthew wants everyone to know that. And this purpose, this underlying drive in Matthew, is a big part of the reason that his gospel story begins by tracing the family lines from Abraham to David, and then from David through many generations all the way to Mary's husband, Joseph. That is Matthew chapter 1. The Messiah must, in order to fulfill prophecy, be born of David's lineage. So, today's reading, Matthew chapter 3, we've jumped from, if you look at chapter 2, Jesus' birth, Herod's killing of the innocents, trying to eliminate this Messiah, Joseph and Mary escaping to Egypt, chapter 3, John the Baptist. But John the Baptist is also someone whose appearance has been predicted. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Matthew says. Look at verse 4. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. That sound weird to anybody? Camel's hair shirt? Makes me itch just saying the words out loud. And it's every bit as weird as it sounds, and it was every bit as weird 2,000 years ago as it is today. Very strange. See, John lived and worked in the wilderness. So his clothing and his diet reflected where he lived and worked. He lived in the wilderness. Even his very appearance, though, just being dressed like that was his sermon. 
how he dressed sent a message to everyone. It was a call to everyone who was comfortable, people who made food and drink and house and worldly goods their chief concerns in life. This was John scolding them. His humble clothing told everyone who looked on him that all that stuff that they thought was important was really just vanity. And they should instead turn their attention on things that are far more essential in God's kingdom. You only had to look at him to see that people really don't need very much to survive. And that's something that we, especially modern, comfortable Westerners, easily forget. And did you notice John doesn't go into the city to preach to the people? They come out to him. He doesn't leave the wilderness. By drawing them out to be with him, he makes them share a little bit of his austere life, life with no comforts, just the essentials. So people had to leave their big comfy houses and workshops, the markets, their office. They had to get away from city comforts to hear him. And while they did, they put these distractions behind them to give their thoughts to what we might call higher things, at least for a little while. All right, let's talk about that garment that John wears, his garment of camel's hair. One scholar says it was coarse and rough in texture. I bet it was. But this was just like the clothing worn by the poorest of the poor. And so with this rough robe, there naturally had to go a girdle with it to hold it at the waist. This girdle we typically translate into English as loins, right? Gird your loins. The girdle kept the robe from flapping open and it made it possible to tuck it up when walking. And it was made of leather, but it too was very cheap. You know, we have some details in John's description. Did you notice what's missing? No mention of sandals. I don't think he had shoes on. So this camel hair garment with a cheap leather belt, any Jew in that day would have easily recognized he is dressed exactly the same way as Elijah. Elijah is arguably the most influential prophet, or at least the most famous prophet of ancient days. Elijah dressed exactly like this. Elijah also ate locusts and honey. And Elijah also preached a stern message of repentance, just like John did. And he did so seven centuries before John. Seven centuries. It is not a coincidence that this place where John was preaching his message is the same place where Elijah was last seen before being taken up into heaven by God. With God, there are no coincidences. Now, the message that John preached was exactly what Isaiah, Isaiah said it would be, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. The same message Elijah preached. We said that is a message of repentance. But before we get to the R word, let's, let's talk about the meaning of this wilderness, this word you've heard me say a dozen times or so already. Throughout scriptures, whenever you see wilderness, Old Testament or New Testament, let's remember what that means. Now, I don't know about you, I, I had a chance to go to the Holy Land, but before I did, if you said wilderness to me, my first thought was a thick forest, far away from any sign of human life, right? Lots of trees, 
hard to work your way through, maybe some underbrush, no civilization. That was my image, okay? Then I went there. That is not what Matthew's describing. That is not what you will find there. The area where John is, is more like a desert, okay? There really aren't many trees. There are some plots and some orchards that have been planted that have palms, right, fig palms, but most of the landscape is really dry. There is scrub brush. The soil is mostly sand. There are entire seasons where if there are creek beds running through it, they go completely dry. There's no water for miles around. In other words, food and water are often scarce, and there's almost nothing that you can call shelter. It's not a good place to be stuck or lost. And it's dangerous for a variety of reasons. Being so far away from the city, there's a strong likelihood you could get attacked by dangerous animals because they're looking for food too. And if that wasn't bad enough, because it's far from the city, there's less security, less law enforcement, and that means thieves and robbers. They're more likely to attack you in the wilderness than they are close to the city where they might get caught. The wilderness was not a good place to be, ever. Now think about the times the wilderness is the setting for the story of God's people when we actually read about it in Scripture. The first place we really see it is after the Exodus. The wilderness is where God's people wandered for 40 years. Now, they shouldn't have been in the wilderness for that long. It should have been a short time, just something they had to get through to get to the promised land. But what happened? They were disobedient. They made idols. They worshipped false gods. And they got punished. They faced the consequences of their sin. God delayed their entry into the land that he had promised to Abraham. God fulfilled his promise, but it was delayed. Now, in the new year, when we get into the season of Lent, we'll read about what happens right after today's reading in Matthew, Jesus' baptism. After he is baptized and he comes up out of the water, the very next thing that happens, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In this same wilderness, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Of course, I don't imagine it would be very hard to fast in that kind of environment where food and water are scarce, but he did. He fasted and he was tempted. All right, so that's just two examples. So what do those two examples of wilderness have in common? Well, the wilderness in both instances is a place where it seems like God is distant. When Isaiah talks about the wilderness, he uses it figuratively. In Isaiah, wilderness denotes the hindrances and obstacles which separate the people from God. So a road must be prepared through these hindrances and obstacles on which God may come to his people to deliver them. In Isaiah's time, it's Babylon where many of the people have been taken captive. And though Babylon is inhabited, it is a heathen land. And so Babylon itself is pictured as a desert or a wilderness in which God's people were lost. And all of this, all of this was symbolized by John the Baptist, who was ordered to shout in the literal wilderness near the River Jordan. And one of my favorite seminary professors 
use the wilderness image to describe those times in our lives when our faith is most challenged. When we face loss, when we face difficult or serious change, when our lives take a turn we just don't understand, when something happens that we wouldn't have or couldn't have expected, when we lose someone who means a great deal to us, that is our wilderness. It's a place that doesn't seem able to sustain us. We don't feel safe. Often we feel lost and don't know where to turn. We can't find our way. And these feelings over which we have no control, they can seem like obstacles to our faith, which means they are obstacles to our relationship with God. It's not our fault. It's not our fault to feel like that. We are not actively trying to sabotage our relationship with God. We're not trying to walk away from Him. What happens in the wilderness? What happened to our Savior when He was in the wilderness? He went there and was tempted by Satan. The wilderness is where the tempter does his best work. And he's very good at it. And he is a hard worker. And that is where he sows the seeds of doubt and distrust. So for anyone who finds themselves in such a wilderness, when you do, if you hear a clear voice crying out, that's a good sound to hear, isn't it? Prepare the way of the Lord is a hopeful shout. It lets us know the Lord is coming. He's on the way. And we can then begin to move in that direction. We can move toward the voice. And believe me, closer to the Lord is absolutely better than lost in the wilderness. But prepare the way means so much more than just come closer. We said earlier that Isaiah's message of prepare the way of the Lord was the same as John's message And they are both messages of repentance. Think of it this way. If you don't repent, a lack of repentance will put up obstacles to God. It will. If you do, those obstacles are removed. True repentance opens the way for God. And that, brothers and sisters, is precisely how we prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight, the path directly to the throne of our hearts. Here's what Luther had to say about this. This kind of preparation is spiritual. It consists in the deep conviction and confession that we are unfit, that I am a sinner, poor, damned and miserable with all the works I am able to do. Where this conviction is wrought, the heart will be opened for the Lord's entrance with his gifts and his forgiveness. So it was John the Baptist's task to point everyone to the Messiah who would be coming very shortly after John's appearance. Put another way, John had a lot of work to do and not much time to do it. He knew that if the people were going to see this Messiah for who he actually is, they would first have to admit that they need a Savior. They would first have to recognize their sins, confess them, and repent. Now, I don't know if I've shared this with you before, but I've heard it said that We Lutherans are pretty good at confession, but we're not so good at repentance. That kind of stings a little to hear that, doesn't it? Confession is admitting that you've sinned. 
We can say it. So what's repentance? Repentance is the change in your heart that says you're not going to commit that sin again. You're going to live your life differently. More the way that God wants you to live it. And it ain't always easy. In fact, it rarely is. Now in the craziness that is going on all around us in this world, the world wants to convince everyone that what God calls sin ain't sin. In fact, much of it, the world says, should be instead celebrated. That God and his followers are to be shunned and silenced and considered bad. It is this same world that tells us that there is no such thing as forgiveness. Not to the world. If you've sinned by the world standards, you're guilty. And that's it. There is no confession that is good enough. There is no atonement that is good enough. You cannot repent, and therefore you will not be forgiven. You're done. And all you can do is throw yourself at the feet of the world and say, I'm sorry, over and over again. That is the expectation of the world. Good luck hearing a word of forgiveness. This, brothers and sisters, is a recipe for despair and endless conflict. Sound familiar? That also sounds like wilderness to me. And it sounds exactly like what Satan is working for, doesn't it? So into that mix, December 4th of 2022... We now hear this voice crying out, telling us that the Lord is coming. For those of John's time who were ready to welcome the arrival of the Messiah foretold, it would have been totally appropriate to prepare the way for him. For those of us now who would gladly welcome his return in glory, wouldn't it also be greatly appropriate to prepare the way for him. Isn't it nice to know that that preparation is the same? The work isn't necessarily easy, but at least we know what it is. As I said, we're notorious for not being very good at this repentance thing. But thankfully, that work that work that leads to repentance is done more by the Holy Spirit than it is by we ourselves. Remember what we said in our confession just a few moments ago? We are in bondage to sin and cannot... It's not our work. When we do that confession, we're begging God for mercy. And also for his assistance. His assistance in breaking us free from bondage. Or if you want to use the image this morning, we could say that we're asking for his assistance in getting out of the wilderness. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in and offers that assistance that we're begging for. So, brothers and sisters, as we move ever closer to Christmas Day... We grow ever more eager to welcome the Messiah and his arrival. So what does that look like for you, individually? What do we need to do? What do I need to do to make his path straight, straight into my heart, free of obstruction? If you are in a wilderness of your own, I encourage you to listen to that voice crying out, letting you know that Messiah is on his way. If you haven't heard that voice lately, hear it now. Messiah has come. He has already fulfilled the promise of God in his death and in his resurrection. 
in this Advent season, our hopeful expectation is not in his incarnation, but in his glorious return and victory. Our hopeful expectation is in his return when no one will ever have to wander in the wilderness ever again. And so as his disciples, we look forward to that day. And it is in that promise that we place our hope. And now as Paul said in the second reading today, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because we called an audible this morning and moved our anthem to the beginning, um, we will shortly have our offerings. Wayne, do you have some music you can play? All right, thank you. you to stand as you are able. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we await the coming of Christ in mercy and majesty, let us pray for the church, the world, and for all people according to their needs. Holy Father, you have given us your word of law and gospel to reveal our sin and to show us your salvation. Help us to live lives that are marked by trust and repentance. Drown the sinner in each of us and give us new life by the work of your spirit within us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, in fulfillment of your promises to your people, you sent John the baptizer to call people to repentance and point them to the Savior. Speak your word through your church today and use the proclamation of your word to call all people to faith and draw them to follow Jesus in obedience and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of righteousness, transform the powerful of the world into self-giving servants, that justice and peace may prevail over tyranny and oppression. May world leaders be above reproach as they seek to do what's best for their people. Inspire collaboration between those who are in leadership positions, that your kingdom of peace may reign. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Father, Stretch out your mighty and gentle hand to those who weep because of grief, illness, anxiety, or hardship of any kind. Especially today, we pray for everyone on our prayer list, those we name now in our hearts, and those known only to you. In your loving kindness, bring them joy in the morning. Lord, in your mercy. Be with all pastors in the North American Lutheran Church and those who are working to become pastors. Bless Bishop Dan and his staff, Dean Nathan, Pastor Todd, Pastor Nelson, and all clergy in the Carolinas Mission Region. Guide them in their ministry, strengthen them to do your work, and protect them from all evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, be with our brothers and sisters whose congregations are discerning the call for a new pastor especially Christ United, St. James, and Mount Calvary Lutheran Churches. Assure them of your Holy Spirit's presence throughout the call process and guide us to be good neighbors to them during this transition. Bless their interim pastors as they lead them through this season of change. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant to us, dear Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace with your neighbor.
maker of all things. You have blessed us with these gifts. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places Offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes again to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit, we are bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The meal is ready.
able. Thank you, Jan. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Son, both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Our closing hymn is number 26, Prepare the Royal Highway.
shared this with me this morning. She's been facing some pretty significant medical struggles, and she had some really, really good news from the doctor this week. So let's all give a, a prayer of thanks for that, and please, uh, please let Gloria know we're, we're glad to hear her news. Thank you. Now, Jane, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> 